So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this talk. I'm Nicola Karsler. I work in the Department of Environment and Geography. And today, what I want to talk to you about is my research, which focuses on indoor air pollution. And hopefully, by the end of this presentation, you will know a bit more about whether or not there's a dirty secret lurking in your own homes. So when we think about poor air quality, we tend to think about images like this one. So this is showing um, obviously a very polluted city. Lots of cars can be seen in the image. We know that cars emit air pollutants. And then when we have lots of air pollutants, we end up with things like photochemical smog. And in fact, high concentrations of air pollutants have been shown through numerous research studies now to be very bad for human health. So in 2016, the World Health Organization estimated that of the nearly 30 million uh, deaths each year that can be attributed to environmental hazards, about 7 million of those were actually from air pollution. So you can see that air pollution um, has a massive impact on health globally. So for this reason, we measure air pollutants in the atmosphere. And many of you will have seen air quality monitors like this as you walk through places like York, but also other cities around the UK and further afield. And what these air quality monitors are doing is that they're measuring the concentrations of different air pollutants in the atmosphere. And we focus on the ones that we know are harmful to health, like nitrogen oxides and particulate matter. And we have some guidelines set for us uh, formally by the European Union, but also the World Health Organization. And this information is used to help us set guidelines for concentrations of air pollutants. So we would be interested in checking in different locations whether or not the pollutant concentrations exceed those guidelines. And if they do, we can do something about it. And in fact, monitoring air quality in this way in different locations has enabled us to introduce policies that are now starting to show some success. So we're seeing that air pollutant concentrations in many urban areas are starting to decrease, which is really good. Now, during the lockdowns last year that were brought on by the COVID pandemic, we noticed some changes in air quality, which won't be surprising. So obviously there were far fewer cars on the road because people were working from home. So there was less commuting going on. And we noticed changes in air pollutant concentrations and the media picked up on this. And quite often there were reports talking about how air quality had improved. Now for some pollutants, this was true, but it's not the whole story. So this report, um, basically there are lots of um, contributors from York and we looked at indoor and outdoor air quality and we found that some outdoor air pollutant concentrations actually increased during the lockdown and some air pollutant concentrations indoors definitely increased but this didn't get as much attention in the media. So let's just talk through what happened during lockdown. So basically we've said that there were fewer cars on the road and we know that these cars emit nitrogen oxides. That's one of the main pollutants that are emitted from vehicles. So because there were fewer cars on the road, there were lower concentrations of nitrogen oxides. Now, because nitrogen oxides react with ozone, another outdoor air pollutant, because the nitrogen oxide concentrations went down, the ozone concentrations outdoors went up. Now that's really important for indoor air quality because it's driven by ozone. And the main source of indoor ozone is from outdoors. So if outdoor ozone concentrations go up, so do indoor concentrations. And we know that this indoor ozone drives lots of chemistry. And that chemistry leads to the formation of pollutants indoors, some of which are harmful to health, like formaldehyde, for instance, which is a carcinogen. So we know that there was more chemistry going on indoors, more pollutants were being formed, and also we we're spending more time indoors. So if you remember back to the first lockdown, we we're only allowed out once a day. So we inevitably we're spending more time indoors. And there's also lots of evidence, most of this is anecdotal, that we cooked and cleaned a lot more. So we were cooking more because we, were, we had the opportunity. There's lots of evidence around people starting to bake bread, for instance, but also cleaning more because we were worried about catching the virus. So all of this is likely to have increased both the pollutant concentrations indoors, but also our exposure to them. 
In fact, we spend about 90% of our time indoors. And, and when you start to think about this, you think about how you spend a typical day that you get out of bed, you drive to work, you sit in an office all day, you drive home and spend your evening indoors. It, it actually makes sense, but it's something we don't often think about. And the other important thing here is that we know a lot about outdoor air quality. So as I referred to earlier, we have those monitors monitoring outdoor air quality, lots of research going on outdoors, but we know relatively little about indoor air quality. So let's think about a typical home and typical sources of pollution indoors. And some of these probably are obvious when you start to think about it, but perhaps some are less obvious. So cooking is one activity that leads to pollution indoors. And this is because it's basically another combustion source, just like cars have combustion engines outdoors, produce combustion uh, pollutants like nitrogen oxides and particulate matter. If you cook with gas indoors, it's just another combustion source as are uh, fireplaces. There are less obvious sources perhaps, such as furniture. You can get emissions from furniture, particularly when it's new, new carpets, new sofas. But we also introduce moisture into our homes through things like showering and bathing. Some of the activities we do indoors produce very high concentration. So I've already mentioned cooking. And we know that frying with meat can produce particularly high concentrations of particulate matter. So this is a pollutant we worry about outdoors, formed through vehicles, but you can actually produce much higher concentrations in your own home by frying a burger or bacon. Air fresheners can also produce um, emissions of air pollutants, particularly the fragrance compounds, which is why people buy them after all. Um, but we know that some of these fragrance compounds are very reactive indoors and can go through reactions that lead to the formation, again, of harmful products like particulate matter and formaldehyde, particularly these ones that plug in and are effectively on for several hours. Cleaning can also produce emissions of pollutants indoors. Again, lots of fragrance products are used in cleaning, uh, cleaning agents such as uh, the smell of lemon, the smell of pine. These are all reactive chemicals. Scented candles, same again, you have a combustion source, you also often have fragrances, and smoking. So this is pretty obvious. If you smoke indoors or if you live with someone who smokes indoors, that is going to be your main source of air pollution in the home. So when you put all of these facts together, it turns out that we're actually receiving the vast majority of our, of our um, exposure to air pollutants indoors. Even if those pollutants are generated outdoors and coming through the windows, it's indoors where we're exposed to them. And this is why we need to focus a lot more effort on trying to understand indoor air quality, particularly when some of these pollutants like formaldehyde that I've already mentioned are, you know, maybe uh, five to 10 times higher than outdoors and certainly over the safe limits that we would expect. And when we think about what's happening in the future with a climate emergency, we're making our homes more airtight. We're insulating them. We're making our windows double glaze, for instance. <clears throat> and it's also likely that the pandemic will um, lead to a more permanent shift for home working. So maybe not five days a week, like we've had to do over a lot of the last year and a half, but there'll certainly be all the evidence is suggesting that there's going to be more working from home in the future. So thinking about the air quality in our homes is going to become even more important. So you might think from what I've said so far that, well, this is pretty obvious. We just have to think a bit more about the products we use. We just have to regulate them, maybe think about some of the chemicals that go into cleaners, for instance. But it's not actually that simple. We also need to think about human behavior. So this is a study from York led by Ali Lewis's group in Wackle. And what this is showing is some measurements that were made in six identical homes in York. So these houses were all built the same, they're on the same street, outdoor conditions are exactly the same for all of them. But what we're looking at is some indoor air concentrations. And these are different volatile organic compounds. Now, for most of these compounds, for things like benzene and toluene and these xylene compounds, these are all emitted from traffic. And what you can see is that in each of the six homes, the concentrations of these compounds are very similar, which suggests an outdoor source. But for limonene, shown in orange, and alpha pinene, these are both fragrance compounds used in things like cleaners and scented candles. You can see that there's a lot more variation in the concentrations, and they're a lot higher. And in particular, if you look on the uh, graph on the right hand side here, you can see that in house four, the concentrations are extremely high. 
And this was linked to residents that had a dog. Every time the dog went outdoors to exercise, it came back in the house and the owner would follow it round with a squirty cleaner um, and follow it round and squirt and clean after it. They also used lots of scented candles, so sort of 20 or so candles around the bath every time they had a bath. And you can see that this led to much higher concentrations in this home, which means that we really need to think about behavior as well as the, the kind of chemical processes that are going on to really understand indoor air quality. So that's exactly what we intend to do at York. We've just been uh, successful in gaining a 2.85 million pound research grant from the Natural Environment Research Council. This started in August and will run for the next four years. And we're going to try and look at the factors that affect indoor air quality. And what we're looking at is this kind of nexus between health, indoor air quality and behavior. The idea being that when we do that, we'll be able to try and come up with or help to drive better air quality policy. And the way that we're going to do that is to go into 300 homes in Bradford. And these are families that are part of the Born in Bradford health cohort, if you've heard of that. So basically, these are families that have had their health effects followed for the last seven or eight years. So we know a lot about their health. We're going to measure indoor air pollutants in their homes over the course of about a year. And at the same time, we're going to ask them to keep behavior diaries so we can understand what sort of activities they're doing in the home and hopefully try and understand how do we formulate policies that take into account all of these things to improve the air quality of these people. But in the meantime, there are lots of things you can do to reduce your exposure to air pollution indoors. You can remove pollutant sources, you can increase ventilation rates. Quite often that's as simple as opening the window. It's not always that simple if you live on a busy road, but usually it's possible to open a window that's on the opposite side of the street from the cars. Use clean cleaners, not sprays. So there's lots of evidence that sprays are much more efficient at getting the aerosol, uh, aerosol form of the chemicals into your lungs. So always better to use liquid cleaners, for instance, or roll on deodorants. Use a cooker hood to remove the pollutants when you cook. And if any of this was news to you, then do tell your family and friends, the more people that know, the more people that can take action. And what you shouldn't be doing is what it says on this sign. Um, this was basically a sign from a shop in London, which was telling everyone about pollution levels in London on that day on Monmouth Street. Not quite sure what this actually indicates. We have no information, but a solution is not to douse yourself in an essence that undoubtedly has these fragrances in that can cause indoor air pollution. So I'd just like to say thank you and to acknowledge the people on this slide, particularly my research group, also Ali Lewis and his group in Wackle, funding from the Sloan Foundation via Dr. Paula Olszewski, and just to note that the Ingenious Project is supported by the Natural Environmental Research Council, the grant reference number is here, and my final slide just lists the credits for the images I've used, and thank you very much. <laughs>